All around the world, men and women, people of all ages, have witnessed the awesome manifestation of God's presence, power, and His love rendered in words, words beyond the written pages. Why are we preaching like this? Why do we travel all around the world preaching the gospel? Because Jesus is coming again. And he left us with a message to tell the untold. A message for the whole world. This message of faith in God and His unfailing Word has brought about change in the lives of millions around the world. An improvement that brings many more to such meetings with the man of God, knowing that their lives will never be the same again. Today we bring you excerpts from a special meeting with our man of God, Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris, worth hearing. You see, Receiving the Holy Spirit and knowing the Holy Spirit are two different things. Until you know Him, you will not enjoy the riches of His glory. Even though they belong to you. That's why He said the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand this. Until you know Him, you'll be shortchanging your life. And that's why I'm introducing you again to Him in a new level so you can know who He is. And the limits will be taken away. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You have received that anointing into your life where the dew of heaven comes on you continually. Glory. You may be seated. The Lord is in this place. Amen. Let's open to the Bible. Genesis in chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. This was his dream. He, he, he saw this dream in his sleep. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Amen. Now, some of you, that message is for you. Amen. But we're going on. Make sure that you are listening because as we speak, the Spirit of God will be talking to you at different points. Amen. Are you hearing me? Yes. He'll talk to you at different points. So watch out for what the Spirit of God says to you. Because every one of you, there's a message for you today. Amen. Verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. Pause for a moment. This man had an extraordinary dream. He had gone to sleep. And everything looked normal. Everything was like 
every other day. And then, he had this dream. And he realized that God had been there with him. Possibly he had had some moments of frustration because of what had just happened, you know. He had to flee from home. Didn't really know what was going on. And now, he's in this place. Somewhat lonesome. And then God speaks to him. And he realizes, the Lord has been here and I didn't know it. Is it possible for God to be present and a man doesn't know it? Emphatically, yes. Yes. You don't always know that God is there. He doesn't always announce himself. He doesn't always show up with signs. Elijah was waiting for God. He said he had gone to hear God talk to him. Because certain things had happened and now he really needed to hear from God. Then there was a strong wind. And he thought, God might manifest himself in this wind. And when it was over, God was not in it. There was an earthquake with so much sound. God wasn't there. Elijah was disappointed. God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the quake. He was in a still, small voice. He heard a still, small voice. And God was there. He doesn't always show himself the way many expect him to. The Bible says God hides himself. Why? If he appeared to you in his glory, you'd be blind. He has to reduce it. Because your eyes, your natural eyes, just cannot stand that glory. Remember, Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus with several others, arresting every Christian they could find. Suddenly, the Bible says, a light shone on him from heaven, brighter than the noonday sun. And Saul was blinded by the glory of that light. Because he was leading the bunch. And he looked up, wanting to say, like, what is it? He was blinded. And they all fell when the voice spoke out of them. Out of the light. Called him by name. Saul, why do you persecute me? That's what some people don't realize when they do evil to Christians. They're doing it to Jesus. Jesus didn't say, why are you persecuting my disciples? He didn't say that. He said, why do you persecute me? And Saul didn't realize that's what he was doing. Because he had thought that Jesus was an ordinary man of history. He was dead and gone. And these folks here claiming that God raised him from the dead. He said, Jesus is dead. But that Jesus spoke from that light from heaven and called him by name. And you see, he's a master communicator. The Bible says he spoke to Saul of Tarsus in the Hebrew tongue. Everybody else who was there who understood Hebrew, could not understand the meaning of the words, even though Jesus spoke in the Hebrew tongue. They were confused. They heard a sound and couldn't tell the meaning of the words. Yet, it was in their language. They heard the sound. Imagine this. Saul going outside after that place, and he says, Jesus spoke to me. He says, in the street... We were all going to Damascus. 
How many of you? Who were many? And Jesus spoke to you? Yes. In what language did he speak to you? And then he says, in the Hebrew tongue, of course. And um, so there were others with you that day. And they heard a sound like you did. They saw the light from beyond the sky, maybe. And you claim that he spoke to you? They all heard the same thing. Y'all fell down and there was nothing else. It was just a sound. So, you're lying. God never talked to you. But God did. God did. The others didn't understand the words. They heard a sound. And now they claim Saul's lie. And that's the way it is. We're all sitting together. There's a guy over here and there's another one over there. And we're all in church. And God speaks to one. And he says, the Lord has spoken to me. The other guy says, how? We all heard the same thing. See, he's a master communicator. That's why when you come to church, you better listen to God for yourself. The guy sitting next to you may not hear what you are going to hear. If he will listen well enough, he'll hear something for himself. He's a master communicator. And when he shows up, you don't have to know who he is. Really? Of course, yes. Didn't you read in the Bible? Three men came to Abraham. He was smart. He looked. There's three men over there. And he calls out to them and says, Hello, sirs. Looks like you're on a long journey. Can you come in and let me give you some food and give you some water and you get, get refreshed and continue your journey? And they turned into him. The three men sat down. It turned out one of them was the Lord himself. He was there with two angels. Abraham was smart by the Spirit. And that day, that man who turned out to be the Lord, blessed him and said, I'm going to Sodom. I want to go find out what they've been doing over there. He talked like a man. He says, I want to go and find out like he didn't know it. Of course he already knew. Just like the same way when he showed up, he met Jacob. The Bible says a man wrestled with Jacob. Read your Bible. In after a while, the man said, it's now almost done. I've got to leave. And Jacob said, no, I can't let you go until you bless me. Please bless me. The man said, what's your name? He's asking him like he doesn't know. What's your name? When God says something, if he's asking you a question, doesn't mean he doesn't know. He's not looking for your answer. He's probing your mind. So when he said to Abraham, I'm going to find out if those folks have done according to the evil that I hear and they've been doing. He was waiting for his response. He wasn't going to find out something. He already knew about it. And then Abraham interceded for Sodom. Praise God. You're still there? It's just like the master Jesus. It's no different from his father. He said, I and my father are one. After his resurrection, he was with two disciples. And they were talking about him. The Bible says he was with them. He joined them in the street. And he said, hi guys, what are you talking about? They said, we're talking about one Jesus who was a great man. He was mighty in words and in deeds. Great miracles followed him. And finally, you know, the Romans killed him because the elders of the Jews hated him. And we had thought he would be the one to let the, help the Jews set them free from the Romans. But he dared, he's gone. And the trouble is, some people said he, he's arisen. And uh, some people say they have seen him. Uh, especially some women, you know, these women talk a lot. And then they say they've seen Jesus. <laughs> And Jesus said, 
Oh, slow of heart. Didn't the prophets tell you these things? That Jesus, that the Christ would come and suffer and be raised from the dead? And they said, man, where have you been? You know? And then they got somewhere and Jesus acted like he was going away from there. They said, come on, it's evening. Come stay with us. He pretended he had done that before. So he went with them to the house. When they got in, now he's the one breaking the bread. This is not his house. (laughs) He went in with them to their house to stay the night. And they put the bread on the table and he takes it and he breaks it. And they're like, hey man, who is he? (laughs) The Bible says their eyes were held up. So they could not recognize him. These were his disciples. Not among the eleven. Judas being dead already. But he had a multitude of disciples. They were there when the disciples were questioning the women. Did you say you saw him? Did you say? They were there. These two were there. Finally they went out and Jesus joined them. And now they're with him in the house. And he breaks bread. And gives them bread. Then they remembered him in the breaking of bread. And suddenly their eyes were opened and it disappeared. And you can imagine, you you can imagine the commotion. I mean, the through the doors open. Ah, ah, ah. They're calling out to Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, Matthew, come on. Then when they got there, these 11 were saying something too, and others who were with them. Where have you been? What do you mean, where have we been? Something just happened, we want to tell you. They said, listen, Jesus has arisen. He has appeared to Simon. And they're talking about Simon Peter. And Simon is, you know, he's happy, you know. Yeah, it's true, he appeared to me. <laughs> then they said, we both saw him. He followed us home. He just left us. Think about it. Amen. <laughs> The point I was making was, Jesus had been with these folks a long time, and he showed up, went with them in the street, went into their house, sat down to eat with them, and still they didn't recognize him. Their eyes had to be open to know him. There are too many in the house of God today who don't know when God speaks. There are too many in the house of God today who don't know when the presence of God is there. Because they're looking for the wrong thing. They're looking around. When we say the Lord is here, they're looking around. When we say God is ministering to you right now, they want to know, whether, are they going to feel hot? Are they going to feel cold? And is there going to be the shaking? Like somebody said, uh, she was asked, have you received the Holy Ghost? She said, mm, not yet, I just got the shaking. <laughs> and she was still shaking. I got the shaking. Like there's the shaking and then there's the spirit. I guess she was right. <laughs> because you can shake as much as you want to. That doesn't mean you got the Holy Ghost. You've got to know him for yourself. Stop looking around. You know what the Bible says? You are not come onto Mount Sinai where there was darkness, where there was judgment. It says, but ye are come. Ye are come to Mount Zion. Every one of us is born again. We have been brought into Mount Zion. We were born into Mount Zion. Mount Zion, which he loved, the Bible says. Hallelujah. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Hallelujah. Let me show you a scripture. Psalm 133. Let's read from verse 1. Psalm 133, from verse 1. You ready? Okay. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Verse 2. It's like the precious ointment upon the head. 
that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Now he's talking about the anointing. The anointing that was poured on Aaron, the high priest. Okay? And he says that anointing was so much, the oil was poured in abundance. It went, you remember Aaron's beards were pretty long. That's why the, of note here. And then, even Aaron's beard. And then he says the anointing went down to the skirts of his garments. Dear Lord, verse 3. Oh, as the dew of heaven. And as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Here's where some of the uh, intellectual Bible scholars get thrown off balance. It says, as the dew of heaven. And as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. The King James gets it right. Because some others think it should be as the dew of heaven that descended upon the mountains of Zion. They're separating Haman from Zion, and they're wrong. And so they're looking for Mount Haman, different from Mount Zion. No, they're wrong. That's not the geography you're going to have to find. You're going to have to find exactly what the word says. Why does the word say, as the dew of Haman? And it says here, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Because the psalmist here, understood what Haman was, where Haman was, and he knew exactly what he was talking about. Haman was a place. And there were mountains in Haman. And so he's talking about the same thing. He says, as the dew of Haman. He's referring to the mountains of Haman. And as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. He's talking about the same thing. He says, for there, in that place. The Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Okay, just for the records. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 8. It says here, And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, the two kings of the Amorites, the land that was on this side, Jordan, from the river of Anon, onto Mount Hermon. Have you seen that? Mount Hermon. Go to verse 9. Which Hermon the Sidonians call Sirion? Listen. Which Hermon the Sidonians call Syrian, and the Amorites call it Shaner, the same Haman. So the Sidonians called Haman Syrian, hmm? and the Amorites call Haman Shaner. Hello. <laughs> so the Sidonians had a name for it. The Amorites had a name for it. Go to chapter 4, verse 48. Chapter 4 and verse 48, same book. And Arah, which is by the bank of the river Anon, even unto Mount Zion, which is Hermon. <laughs> Have you seen it now? That's it. Mount Zion, which is Hermon. So he was talking about the same thing. So they had different names for Hermon. Depending on which language you were speaking. So now he tells us, Mount Zion, which is Hermon. So when he says that the dew of Hermon, and he says, the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. He's talking about the same thing. Hermon, Zion. Now here's the point I want to make. The dew of Hermon. Why does he talk about this dew of Hermon, this dew on Mount Zion? Because some thought that it meant that the dew of Hermon went upon Mount Zion. No, he's talking about the same thing. And sometimes you, you notice... He might use the plural or the singular, like talking about the mountains of Zion or Mount Zion. Okay? 
Or he might talk about Mount Hermon or the place Hermon that's got mountains. Are you still there? Okay. So, God has brought us to Mount Zion. And the reason he talks about this dew is that the dew on Mount Hermon is somewhat permanent. There's always dew on Mount Hermon. There's always dew on Mount Zion. This mountain always had dew. It was always wet. Morning, noon, and night, it was wet. And you've been brought to Mount Zion, not Mount Zion. That's where you are. When you were born again, you were brought to Mount Zion, where the dew of heaven comes on you continually. And the dew of heaven is talking about, he says, like the anointing. He says, the anointing on Aaron was like the dew of heaven. So, listen, he's referring to the anointing. That anointing is on you. It was poured out on you. And if you receive the Holy Spirit, you have received that anointing into your life. The problem is, many don't recognize where they are. They don't know. They can see the other fellow wet with dew. And they can't see themselves wet with dew. Why? Because they're looking at the wrong thing. It's in your spirit. Yeah. It's in your spirit. Like, oh, I see the glory of God on your life. What about me? I don't know. I've been praying about it. I've really been talking to the Lord about it. I really hope somehow... My life will have some glory. Hey, you can see the glory of God on that one. And on that one. And then you have another group. They don't see the glory of God on nobody. <laughs> and say, well, I know they say they see the glory of God on people. I've never seen it on anybody. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, that today, it's funny. They say, I've never seen the glory of God on anybody. <laughs> You've never seen the glory of God on anybody. Why have you never seen the glory of God? I tell you. Everybody can't see it. Look at Jesus. The disciples were close with him. They had known him. And now, he's arisen. He's with them. He's glorified. They don't know him. They can't see him. Until their eyes are open. You will not know the scriptures. You may quote them without understanding. The apostles were busy. Ransacking the scriptures. They couldn't find anything. To help them understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because their minds were dulled out. They couldn't understand. They're thinking. What does this mean? They're asking themselves questions. And while those two were with them, testifying of Jesus whom they had just seen, and Simon also letting them know his experience with Jesus, and they're all rejoicing about this thing and thinking about it, Jesus himself shows up in the midst. And then the Bible says they were afraid. They just heard that these ones had seen him. The women were there who said they had seen Jesus. Okay, Simon Peter had said he had seen Jesus. He was there. Two men just came in. They said they had been with Jesus. And now they're all together. Jesus himself shows up in their midst. And they are afraid. And they don't believe. And they think they're seeing a ghost. <laughs> Thinking of where to run. <laughs> Elderly men and women. <laughs> you know, big people can be afraid. That's what little guys don't know till they find out when daddy says, Hold on, Johnny, it's scary. <laughs> scary. Very scary. Where do you think those kids learned those things from? 
Daddy, I was scared. I was scared. Why was he scared? Because daddy said, it's really scary. <laughs> With his baritone voice. <laughs> v chest. He trained that chest for many years. Now he's coming there. Huh? And I said, it's very scary. <laughs> he's afraid. Fear has no respect. Because you see, fear is a spirit. Didn't you read it? Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. He was bigger than everybody in Israel. He was made king of Israel. But when he saw Goliath, he turned into a chicken. <laughs> Thinking of what to do. They're discussing how to take him out. And each, every idea that somebody brought up, another one killed it. Somebody said, we can throw something like, you know, like we do horses. They said, shut up. By the time you get him, what about the other guy next to him? He said, he's got four brothers, and they're all giants, and they're all in the crowd. Said, but, but, but if we do something, let's, okay, well, let's just all go out at once. They said, we are outnumbered. Oh. <laughs> no idea was good enough. Until one little guy, 17 years old. Oh. Little guy David comes and he says, I can take him out. <laughs> and they tell the king, and he says, bring the guy here. And they bring him, he's small, David. And Saul's still looking for the person they want to bring. Where is he? He said, he's down there. <laughs> he says, oh, he was disappointed. Until the guy said, I can. Oh, king, live forever. I can. I was taking care of my father's sheep. A lion came. I went after the lion. I caught him by his beard. When Saul heard that, he opened his eyes. You don't mean that happened, boy. He said, sir, not only that. A bear came one time. I went after the bear. And I smote him. And Saul was thinking. And the little guy said, and this giant will be like one of them. Amen. That was what they needed. Somebody who was born and who was not going to listen to some other ideas and calculations. You know, if we do it like this, we might be able to take him out. If we go with five, mm, five battalions. No, this guy said, I need five stones. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Are you still in this place? Yes. How are you going to know when he talks to you? Listen for the still small voice in your heart. Somebody said, well, if God wants to talk to me, he can come. After all, I don't have to invite him. He'll come when he wants to. God is not like that. You know what? He already did. You're the one that didn't listen. He already did. Let's go back to the scriptures and, and look at something. The Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and the Jewish people. They knew Messiah was coming. They heard all the prophets talk about the Messiah coming. When he came, what happened? They killed him. What were they waiting for? What were they expecting? A king in the palace? I've thought about it many times. What were they expecting? What did they want the Messiah to look like? What did they expect of him? The scriptures said what he'll do. And he did those things. And yet they could not believe. The Bible says, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And every time he said anything that sounded like he was Messiah, they spat at him. Who are you? We know your mother. We know your daddy. We know your brothers and sisters. When Messiah comes, we are not supposed to know where he's from. Lie. God.
God said, from among your brethren. He said, I'll raise one from among your brethren. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise unto you. Moses said, like unto me. From among your brethren. Now they said, when Messiah comes, we're not going to know where he's from. Glory to God. Amen. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who is he to you? Who is Jesus to you? You know, until you meet the Holy Spirit, until you know him, your success will be limited. Until you get to meet the Holy Ghost, you see, receiving the Holy Spirit and knowing the Holy Spirit are two different things. Until you know the Holy Spirit, your success as a pastor, as a leader, as a, a, a businessman, your success as anything, will be limited, largely limited, until you meet this teacher from heaven. Until you know him. You know, I tell people, the most important thing in my life is my fellowship with the Holy Spirit. When I entered into fellowship with the Holy Spirit, my life was altered completely and has been so ever since. I was only glad it happened to me early in my life. Until you know him. Let me take a very successful man like Job, for example. Can you go to Job chapter 1? Let's read from verse 1. So we get a good description of this man. Job chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Okay, verse 2. And they were born unto him seven sons and three daughters, ten children. Okay? Verse 3. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. You can write them down if you want to because we're going to make some comparison later. 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household. That means he had a lot of people living with him. So that this man was the greatest Listen, not one of the greatest, but this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Job was not described to us as a prophet. Job was not a pastor. I'm just trying to let you know the man we're dealing with here. This man was like, he was a businessman. You can see what he was trading with. Are you still there? <laughs> Successful man, upright. One that shunned evil. A man who served God with his life. Okay. All right. All right. So rich. He was the greatest of all the men of the East. This man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Hey, God has had some real tough guys. Come on. What do you think? He's had some people. So a lot of people feel that, you know, God always, you know, is always identified with some broke guys, you know. He always loves people who are broke. It's not true. It's not true. He loves them, but he doesn't only love the broke guys. He loves everybody. And he has had quite some rich fellows. The only way this man could lose what he had because he did lose what he had, was when Satan showed up in his life, all right, because of his fears. We don't have the time to talk about it today, but, you know, through the scriptures, you discover why Satan had an inroad to his life. But that's not the point I want to make. Let's go to chapter 42. Hmm. 
You would like this one. Chapter 42 from verse 5. This man had lost everything. He got to the point in his life he began to question God. You've heard the story of Job. He questioned God. Until God manifested himself to Job in his word. And when he did, Job said, I have, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. He had heard of him. And he served God because he heard of God. Faith came to him. He served God with his life. Like many of you, you've heard of the Holy Ghost. You received the Holy Ghost by faith. You've heard of him, but you haven't met him. Karamanduga. Go to verse 6. Wherefore, I have bore myself and I repent in dust and ashes. You see that? Back to verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now I see you. Now I see you. New knowledge had come to him. Before this happened, he was questioning God. His friends had come to him to try to find out what might have cost it. They brought different kinds of ideas. Maybe you did this wrong. Maybe this was the reason. Maybe this was the reason. Finally, Job had had it. He said, no, stop, everybody. Stop. I've looked at my life. I haven't seen where I went wrong. Job said his friends were wrong. But then God, God said Job's friends were wrong. Job said his friends were wrong. But you see, Job couldn't find where the problem was. And God said that Job was perfect. But God didn't like the fact that this man began to say, come on, what have I done wrong? Let God show up and tell me what I've done wrong. That's what he said. He told his friends, he said, look, you've all been talking without knowledge. Hold on. I am waiting for him. I want God himself to show me my error. Let him show me my error. His wife came and said, look, I don't know what you're still waiting for. You are so sick now, it's better for you to die. Just curse God and die. He said, are you one of those foolish women outside? Don't you know that good and bad can come from God? God, you are here and there. Tell me what I've done. What have I done? And finally, God said to him, since you know everything, <gasps> he heard the voice of God. Now God spoke to him in a vision. And God said, since you know everything, tell me something. Where does the wind reside? Do you know? Where is the source of light? He was trembling there. And God began to question Job and he was throwing big ones at him. Big questions just to tell Job, your mind is limited. There's so much you don't know, young guy. Come on. And then he fell down on his knees. He said, oh God, forgive me. I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now, I see you. I repent in dust and ashes. I said, until you know the Holy Spirit, your pride may overtake you. Until you know him, your success will be limited. Go to verse 10, from verse 10. Same book, Job chapter 42, from verse 10. Let's see what happened. And the Lord, you know, after he repented like this, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice. You can read all the way to verse 17, and I told you to write down what he had before. And you see the figure is given to us again of each of what he had before. The man had twice, more than twice what he had before. God blessed him so much. Listen, God can give you much more than you already have, no matter how successful you are. When you meet the Holy Spirit, when you meet the Holy Spirit, when those apostles didn't know about the Holy Spirit, they had heard of him. They had heard of him. They had heard of the Holy Spirit, how he led the people through the wilderness. They had heard of him. 
And now Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. And they were just there wondering about the Holy Spirit. They thought they knew the scriptures. Let's read something. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. From verse 43. Let's read. And he took it and did eat before them. Okay? He asked for something to eat. And he did. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45. Look at this. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Look at what he did. These guys had read the scriptures. They had heard Jesus talk. But they still didn't get it. The Bible says he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. There are people who will read this Bible all their life and never understand it. I have known teachers of religion. Bible religious knowledge. Teachers who read this Bible. They went to university and read this Bible and got PhD in this Bible and still didn't understand squat. They didn't get it. Because the understanding was not given to them. Whew. Oh dear. Job chapter 32. Go to verse 8. It says, There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Now, that word written, translated inspiration, is the word breath. Okay? So you find in many newer versions, the word is translated breath. The breath of the Almighty giveth them understanding. It says, There's a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty, the breath of the Almighty, gives them what? Understanding. Okay. Go back to St. Luke's Gospel. Chapter 24, where we read, verse 45. Then opened he their understanding. What did he do? How did he open their understanding? The Bible is not telling us here that he explained the scripture. He already told them, I have told you these things before. All right? He said, I've told you these things before. I've taught you these same scriptures before. So he was not going to go through the scriptures again. They had read it. But he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What did he do? We just read it. The breath of the Almighty gave them understanding. The breath of the Almighty. What is the breath of the Almighty? It's the Spirit of God. The inspiration. Oh dear Lord Jesus. It is the impartation of the Spirit that brings understanding. That's why he called it inspiration. He talks about the breath of the Almighty. The inspiration, the breath, the impartation of the Spirit brings understanding. How did Jesus do it? St. John's Gospel chapter 20. Look at verse 22. St. John's Gospel. Chapter 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, look at it, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This was what happened. This was what Luke was talking about when he said he opened their understanding. Because at this time, the Holy Ghost had not come to take up his ministry. That will happen in the book of Acts. That time had not come because Jesus had not gone to heaven. He's still telling them, I'm going to the Father. When I get to the Father, he will send you the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit hadn't come because Jesus had not gone. He had not yet been glorified. He hadn't gone to the Father yet. But at this time, he says to them, receive you the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them. That was the impartation. The spirit of understanding was granted them. And suddenly, they understood the scriptures. Glory to God. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Wonders. I said without the Holy Spirit, your knowledge will be juvenile. You would think you know something. But you'll be dotting around questions. 
until the Holy Spirit imparts your mind with understanding. Glory to God. Look at what Jesus said of him. St. John chapter 14 from verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Hallelujah. All things. He'll teach you history in school. He'll teach you geography. He'll teach you chemistry and physics. <laughs> like he taught me mathematics. Are you still here? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And not only will he teach you, he will bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. <laughs> I said, until you meet the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what effort you are putting in that shop. It doesn't matter how large it might get. To be limited. When you meet the Holy Ghost, your life will be turned around yeah. into another realm of glory. Yeah. I've seen pastors, I've seen ministers who have labored for years. They have worked so hard. And they have wondered, what else should I do? They've labored, they've preached. They've labored. And they don't know how to retain the people. They have brought people to church and the people came and left. They brought them to church, they came and left. And I've said there's only one thing you need. You need to be introduced to someone who is already living inside you. I said, really? Yes. That voice that asked you, have you prayed today? And you thought, huh? Oh. You thought it was your mind. Yes. Yes. When he spoke from heaven, you know, that light was shining from heaven. And, and, and Saul of Tarsus and the rest of them, they fell down. When Saul got up, because he heard his name. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, who art thou, Lord? Still didn't recognize his voice. He says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise. Hallelujah. I am Jesus. Holy Spirit saying to you, you've not been speaking in tongues very much. You, say, mm. you think it's your mind reasoning. You think it's your mind. He says, you're not reading the Bible enough. Mm -hmm. What did you hear? He said, my mind was just telling me. Now, you are not able to distinguish between your mind and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you don't know him yet. You have received him, but you don't know him. He's still like a guest in your house. He said, when he, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, when he comes, he says, he will teach you all things. Oh, there'll be no limitation to your knowledge anymore. He will teach you all things. Where is that limitation? He will teach you all things. I'm unlimited. Absolutely unlimited. The Holy Ghost is my teacher. Come on, say the Holy Ghost is my teacher. The Holy Ghost is my teacher. Yes, but you have to learn to listen to him in little things. You think that he'll start out by giving you some big scripture like this. No, very simple things. Very simple things the Holy Spirit can tell you. You're wearing the wrong shoe. You say, oh, the Holy Spirit? Yes. yes. He says, I want you to pray now. You look around. It's not convenient to pray. Mm -mm. So you go. When Jacob met him, Jacob's life was changed forever. He blessed him. He says, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Yeah. When you meet the Holy Spirit, he changes your life. Yeah. He always adds something to your life. He'll make
make you a success. You become unlimited. Thank you, Lord Jesus. What do you want in your life? Turn to first St. John's Gospel, chapter 16, from verse 12. John chapter 16, verse 12. I have yet, Jesus is talking. See, he's still introducing the Holy Spirit. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I, 13. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come. That's the Holy Ghost. When he is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you the future. He will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is a healer? That's the spirit the Bible says, if he lives in you, he will vitalize your model body. If he lives in you. It doesn't matter that you've been diagnosed with some disease. If he lives in you, there will be a change. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Maybe you're a student. This is the one you need. This teacher inside you is the one you need to listen to. Because he knows everything. 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 Yesterday we read about Jesus. That he is the embodiment of all wisdom and knowledge. Jesus is. But who administers that wisdom of Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Oh, let's, let's read further. Back to verse 13. Let's read. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. You see? He will take that which is Jesus. He will take from the wisdom of Jesus. He will take from the knowledge of Jesus and show it to you. Jesus is the embodiment of all wisdom and knowledge. But the Holy Spirit will take from all that Jesus has and minister it unto you. Oh, glory to God. He shall receive of mine and show it unto you. That's why people who don't know the Holy Spirit, they may quote about Jesus, about the knowledge of Jesus. They can preach about the Holy Spirit. See, I've met preachers who have preached of the Holy Spirit all their life, but they have never known the Holy Spirit. They're like Job. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. Are you hearing me? They preach of the Holy Spirit, but where are the manifestations of the Holy Spirit? Not there. Oh, where is the voice of the Holy Spirit? Not there. Where is the wisdom of the Holy Spirit? Not there. Because they haven't known him. He shall receive of mine and show it unto you. He's the administrator of the riches of God. Until you know him, you will not enjoy the riches of his glory. Even though they belong to you. That's why he said the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand. He has blessed you. You are a joint heir with Christ. You have everything that God determined for you to have. But the administrator of the inheritance is the Holy Spirit. Until you know him, you'll be shortchanging your life. You have this world untold and yet be unable to enjoy it. Because you haven't known the administrator. You know that guy whose father died? And left the will in the hands of the administrator. And this fellow doesn't know who the administrator is. He will never enjoy the wealth. Even though his name is on it. You need to know the true manager 
of God's wealth. He's the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that's why I'm introducing you again to Him in a new level so you can know who He is. Amen. And the limits will be taken away. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. See, there are many people who have been trying with their minds because they have some erudite knowledge. They have been schooled. But you know what? Your mind will bring you to terrible limitation until you realize that the mind is never enough. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. Let's look at that. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, hey, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Woo! Not by might. They may describe you as a mighty brain. They may describe you as one of the world's intelligentsia. Makes no difference. It is not by might. It is not by power. But by my spirit. Hi -ya. By my spirit. Have you been trying to do it in your own power? In your own ability? By my spirit, saith the Lord. How are you going to grow that church? By my spirit. How are you going to grow that cell? By my spirit. How are you going to multiply your finances? By my spirit. How are you going to build that business? By my spirit. By my spirit. By my spirit, saith the Lord. Success by the Holy Ghost. You become a mystery to others. Yes. You become a wonder yes. to your generation. Can you shout amen, somebody? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. By my spirits. That's why you've got to know the Holy Ghost. You've got to understand the things of the Spirit of God. He says, it's not by might. It's not by power. But by my spirits. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory. Somebody shout, glory, glory. Woo, glory. I am glory. Hey, glory. Woo, glory. Glory. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Sit down one more moment. You'd see why the apostles took the ministry of the Holy Spirit so seriously. Because Christianity without the Holy Spirit is mere religion. But if you want to go past religion, if you want to know the reality of the Spirit of God, the reality of the kingdom of God, the reality of the glory of God, you've got to know the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, Sondarabagi de Basete. Hmm. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Acts chapter 14. I said it took the ministry of the Holy Spirit so seriously. Let's read from verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and I taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium and Antioch. Next verse. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Look at that. They went to those cities. What did they do? Confirming the souls of the disciples. Confirming the souls of the disciples. How did you do that? Two things. The first one is by laying on of hands. The second one is by exhortation. So they told you the first one there, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them. They laid hands on them. Laying on of hands is primarily for impartation and for strengthening. That's the word confirming. The word translated confirming means strengthening. 
By laying on of hands, they strengthen their souls. Do you hear? He didn't say they strengthen their hearts. Their souls. So it was a spiritual thing. Laying on of hands is a very spiritual thing. So when hands are laid on you and all you're feeling is the hand on your head, then you didn't get nothing. No, you receive by faith. You receive with your spirit. It's very spiritual. The impartation is an impartation of something spiritual as well. The apostles going from church to church, strengthening, confirming, confirming the disciples, confirming their souls, the souls of the disciples. The only thing is, you know, anybody can talk about confirmation, but until you know how it is to confirm and then have the spirit by which to confirm, the confirmation may not work. You can only give what you've got. Is that right? You can give anybody what you don't have. You know? Something that has not been ministered to you, you, you can minister to someone else. It's only that which has been ministered to you that you can minister to others. Hallelujah. So they went confirming the disciples by the laying on of hands and by exhortation of the word. Their spirits were confirmed, strengthened. I told you the very first night, the reason I'm here. You remember? Because God sent me to you. And so, this is the time, the moment we have arrived. And what I share with you about the Holy Spirit, receive into your spirit. Amen. Receive that word. Receive that word. And use that word. Use it to move forward in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. 